Hallo zusammen and welcome to the second edition of the Rammstein Experience, a compilation of thematically fitting Rammstein videos that are about more or less the same topic. In this case, learning German with Rammstein, not with specific songs, but in a broader, more general sense. Certain words, phrases and the like. This curated compilation video is subdivided into three chapters. The first one is about linguistic details. For instance, the trilled or rolled R in Rammstein songs and why Till Lindemann actually uses that. Till Lindemann speaking German, analyzed linguistically speaking, for language learners especially. And of course, the correct pronunciation of the band's name explained in detail. Chapter 2 focuses on the song titles being translated to English and what they mean. And last but not least, in Chapter 3, words and phrases in Rammstein songs and how to learn German with them. I'm gonna be explaining which Rammstein songs are best for learning German, especially as a beginner. I'm also gonna be talking about the most often used German words in Rammstein songs and what they mean. In addition to that, I'm gonna be explaining certain ambiguous words in Rammstein songs. German phrases, of course, as well. And last but not least, the most poetic lines in Rammstein songs and what they translate to in English. Since most of these videos were made prior to my channel name change from Vlog Dave to Definitely, you may very well see a few lower thirds, including older links to my socials. And if you want to find the new links to all those things, including my support options such as Patreon, Ko-fi or PayPal, you can of course find those in the video description down below right here. So grab a cup of coffee or tea or some biscuits, cookies, cake, wh whatever, maybe all at once and definitely enjoy learning some German with Rammstein. Hallo zusammen! Of course, Germans are able to comprehend Rammstein songs as they are with the German lyrics, what they could mean, what they might intend and imply and whatnot. So that's an obvious thing. And of course, it's completely understandable that foreigners might struggle with those things, what the lyrics mean. They might like the sound of the words and what Till expresses in the songs but they might not know what they are about. However, and this might come as a surprise to you of sorts, Germans might also be quite uncertain about why Till Lindemann, the singer in Rammstein, sounds the way he sounds. Where is he coming from? He rolls the R very expressively. Is that related to a certain dialect even? And I personally also think that's a pretty interesting question. Why do Rammstein sound the way they sound, especially vocal-wise? What is that related to? So today, I, a native German and someone who has studied German language studies, meaning the German language and how it works, I want to try to explain what the background information to those things could be and are. And so on. So let's go. So if I were to find some, well, proofs or hints on why Till Lindemann sounds the way he sounds when he sings, I would probably start looking at his origin, where he's from, and what kind of German people speak there. So let's do that. Till Lindemann was born in Leipzig on January the 4th in 1963. Leipzig is a pretty big and well-known city in the state Sachsen, Saxony, which is one of 16 German states that are part of the Federal Republic of Germany. In short, Germany. Now, we could check out what natives living in that eastern part of Germany sound like when they speak German, and in fact, this dialect we commonly know as Sächsisch is a comparably distinct way of speaking German. Maybe that actually will tell us more. The linguistic way of this way of speaking German is Obersächsischer Dialekt. And apart from Saxony, Sachsen, it's also spoken in the states of Thüringen, Thuringia and Sachsen-Anhalt, Saxony-Anhalt, all located in the Middle East part of Germany. However, nowadays, this way of speaking can rather be referred to as a colloquial regialect, since definition-wise, a dialect, 
is pretty much an individual linguistic variant with own words and expressions you wouldn't find in standard German or in other German dialects. And apart from that, the outer lines or the linguistic periphery of dialects and where they are commonly spoken are pretty much blurred nowadays anyway. And while all of this is good to know and I guess quite interesting to you guys as well because I guess you also watch my videos because you're interested in German and learning German, in the case of Till Lindemann and finding out why he sounds the way he sounds when he sings, this doesn't really matter too much. Not only because you don't have that rolled R sound in the Saxonian way of speaking, but also because he was raised in another German state way up in the northeast of Germany called Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, Mecklenburg-West Pomerania. These days it's common to speak standard colloquial German there for many people, but there are also some dialects which are especially common in those certain regions. A good example is Ostniederdeutsch, a variant of Niederdeutsch, Low German, which a couple of decades and centuries ago was spoken regularly, especially in the upper parts of Germany, and could also be identified as an own linguistic system next to High German, at least depending on which linguist you might ask, and there have been different forms and variations of Niederdeutsch as well, so it's not just one single dialect in that sense. And as a side note, if you look at a Low German word like Appel, this strongly reminds of the English apple, so Low German is actually more commonly, while not associated with English, but sort of similar, at least regarding some expressions and words. Some natives living in Mecklenburg-West Pomerania might also speak the Berlin dialect, or rather little dialects, and a mixture of those and standard German there. However, as well, linguistically logical that approach is to look at his origin, his dialect and what they speak there, meaning the Germans that live in that region, that doesn't really help us in this case. So I suggest that we should change the perspective. Now that we know this isn't related to Till's very own dialect and where he's from, where could this rolled R especially, that one, really come from? What could be the origins of that R sound in German? There are many German dialects and some have remained more commonly spoken and basically alive than others, who gave and give way to standard German more and more. The most common and obvious example for a distinct R sound in a German dialect is the Bavarian dialect. Technically, it's not just one distinct dialect, but rather a group of dialects that are spoken in Bayern, Bavaria in the south of Germany, in the majority of Österreich, Austria, some territories in Tschechien, the Czech Republic, Italian, Italy, Ungarn, Hungary and die Schweiz, the Swiss Republic. When these people speak German, they tend to roll the R in a very expressive way. Ich glaub, dir brennt der Hurt. Respectively, they stress the consonant R in spoken German, which mainly has to do with how they verbalize and intonate vowels right before the R. Let's take a look at the word der Markt, singular, the market. Der Markt would be the standard way of verbalizing that term in standard German. Whereas in northern Germany, people would tend to stress the A, meaning to prolong the vowel A in that case, people in Bavaria and in the other just mentioned regions rather tend to verbalize it very briefly and shortly. So in northern German it could sound like Markt, whereas in southern German it could be Markt, something like that. Maybe you already know about this, but a common reason why Till Lindemann's singing voice and the overall gesture and appearance of Rammstein keep being associated with the likes of Adolf Hitler and the Third Reich is that we all have heard some Hitler speeches in school and elsewhere. And Hitler was born in Austria, yet lived in Munich, München, the capital city of Bayern, for quite a while. Especially in public propaganda speeches, he sounded very distinct, loudly up front and wanted to grab the attention of everyone listening that way. He sort of had a tendency to stress and over-articulate certain elements, which also gave an impression of a harsh-sounding German language. As a native speaker, I suppose foreigners who have only heard about the German language and don't know too much about it, might associate the basic sound of it with that harsh intonation, which isn't typical for the vast majority of German dialects or even standard German at all though. So even though I see and get why people think that Till sounds so harsh and Hitler-like, I think it's a prominent ingredient of Rammstein's everlasting love of provoking people at the end of the day. 
I mean, if you followed their career, they have done that multiple times. For instance, by using snippets of a Leni Riefenstahl propaganda video for the Depeche Mode cover Stripped, which according to the band and management was chosen out of aesthetic reasons. It shows naked athletes and they didn't choose that because they wanted to pay a tribute to the Third Reich ideology or the Riefenstahl propaganda. We're talking about Rammstein at the end of the day. This all works as a way of provoking and getting attention. I also state this because this intended provocation isn't the only potential reason why Till sounds the way he sounds when he sings. As you might have noticed, I've specifically talked about Till's singing voice, and I did that on purpose. When you hear Till Lindemann giving interviews, which is a rare occasion, you'll immediately notice that he doesn't roll the R there at all. So a gestenreiches Zwiegespräch da führen kann, irgendwie und ein bisschen acten, irgendwie keine Ahnung. Das Aber ansonsten gucke ich da nicht so. Ich suche mal einen Punkt irgendwo hinten. And there are quite a few Rammstein songs where he doesn't roll the R even once either. A good example would be Ohne Dich on Reise Reise. I guess here he doesn't use that phonetic style or figure, since judging from Till's standards, he sings rather high and the rather harsh sounding approach might not fit the theme of the song for the most part either. A good example for not using the rolled R sound here is the chorus line. Mit dir bin ich auch allein. With you, I'm still alone. In the typical Rammstein style, it would sound like this. Mit dir bin ich auch allein. Of sorts. This once again shows that this intonation doesn't necessarily have anything to do with his dialect or the way he has learned to speak German. Here, it rather reminds of a specific type of consciously speaking or singing German. The so-called Bühnendeutsch or Kunstdeutsch, stage German that is. Nope, these aren't dialects, but rather German intonations and verbalizations that have been and are common in theater plays and opera. It's basically an artificial way of verbalizing and expressing, stressing the consonant R in German in the sense of not being based around a dialect the actors or singers really speak themselves natively. It's basically a stylistic device for strengthening and underlining the meaning and the sound of statements and sentences in a theater play by being very expressive with the intonation of consonants in contrast to the vowels. Most modern plays might not feature that as often anymore, maybe also because the acoustics are better these days, but it was a pretty common thing back in the day. Here's a little example of a modern play of Die Räuber by Friedrich Schiller, which he wrote in 1781, a long, long time ago. And here you can actually hear a little snippet, a little bit of a rolled R. It's a little snippet with sort of a vintage filter over the soundtrack, in the literal sense of the word. And that's why it sounds, well, quite classy and old-fashioned. Oh, ihr Mächte des Himmels, entlastet mich dieser tödlichen Wollnuss. And when I think about it, it actually makes sense, because the lower you sing, the more certain consonants and sounds might probably sound blurry or get dropped in a phonetic sense. So yeah, it might be a good idea to overemphasize on them and over expressing them by using something like that rolled R sound. So summing things up, this stylistic approach, meaning the rolled R in particular, works from both a German and a foreign perspective, because it reminds of certain dialects and historic German figures, even though the rolled R in this case is not related to those dialects, and because of this reference to German figures and it makes you think of that, this works as a provocative aspect, it makes the consonants sound more distinct, especially when singing in a low register. It generally sounds very expressive and phonetically interesting, also for foreign ears. It lifts the vocal melody and the vocal line from the loud instrumentation and gives it a very own character. It has what we Germans call a huge Wiedererkennungswert, a recognition factor or recognition value. And in that sense, it distincts Rammstein from most other bands, German and non-German. And last but not least, it might also make people think of a classic quality to the music, if they are aware of that classic stage German sound. Diese, uh, war a first very obvious thing, even if you don't know too much about the German language yet, he doesn't roll the R when he speaks daily German. Why is that? 
That's nothing unusual though, quite the opposite. Don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean he is fake whatsoever, it just shows that him rolling the R so prominently has nothing to do with his own dialect or way of speaking German. It's rather a stylistic choice, based on theatrical expressive German, a natural fit regarding his low singing voice and the content he's singing about. If you want to find out more about this whole topic, feel free to check out my video about that in the end card. And by the way, please keep in mind that whenever I'm gonna say something like, okay, that's not grammatically correct and, you know, that sort of deviates from the ordinary norm, for instance in written German, that doesn't mean that Till doesn't know how to use his own language, of course. It just means that colloquial, daily, spoken German can really, really differ from, well, the standard written or high German that you might learn in school. All right, all right. So let's continue. Diese uh, location war eigentlich außergewöhnlich. Something you might also get right away is him using the interjection or particle a. Eh. It's very similar to the English, uh, but it usually gets verbalized more like the German umlaut a. Eh. Das war eine Stierkampfarena oder eine Gladiatorenarena oder so. Eine Stierkampfarena. Short forms are very common in colloquial informal German. Something that's very typical is saying n when you actually mean the longer form of it, the feminine, indefinite singular nominative and accusative article eine. Eine Stierkampfarena for die Stierkampfarena being a feminine noun. However, this n is not to be confused with the equally common conversational particle n at the end of sentences, which gets verbalized slightly more stressed and, you know, upwards, it's rather n. It's quite similar to saying right at the end of sentences in English. So it's so an Amphitheater. So an Amphitheater. We've just talked about a short form of eine. And this one is quite similar, except this right here is a contraction, a merging of two words to a shorter one. In this case, it's so, such, and the colloquial short form of the neuter, indefinite, singular, nominative and accusative article ein. Hm, so ein, so ein Amphitheater, for das Amphitheater being a neuter noun. Sieht steinalt aus. Steinalt. I've made a video about the interesting German adjective steinreich, literally stone rich, before, and this is another good example of a few German adjectives that feature the prefix stone. It's pretty much an increasing prefix. For instance, in this case, it's combined with the adjective alt, old. And when something is steinalt, stone old, it's really, really freaking old, pretty much ancient. In addition, leaving out the subject or other parts of speech is quite common in colloquial German too. Denkst du, das ist so dieses Kolosseum in Rom? Denkst du, das ist so dieses Kolosseum in Rom? Denkste is a contraction, a combination of the conjugated verb denkst for the second person singular, Präsens, the German simple present, indicative mode, active of denken, to think or reflect, and the just mentioned du, which is the common informal singular form of address, for instance when you're talking to a family member, a friend or someone else close to you. Usually it would be du denkst, or lining up with the syntactical order of the sentence denkst du, but this would merge to denkste. The du turns to the suffix a, uh, which gets verbalized in a highly typical German way, the schwa sound, which basically is a weak, unstressed, bored German e. Uh, denkste. This way of merging a verb and a personal pronoun is very typical and not limited to this specific case at all. However, don't confuse it with the normal way of expressing a verb in the preteritum, the German simple past, which would be ich dachte, I thought. It also makes use of the schwa, but this is a completely different context. Because in this case, the e or e uh, belongs to this conjugated form of the verb. It's not a contraction. Man kriegt gute Laune irgendwie. Man kriegt gute Laune irgendwie. This is a great German example for a highly typical phenomenon and one of the most common differences between spoken and written German, both formal and informal, by the way. The verb kriegt is spelled with a g, but when most Germans verbalize it, the g is verbalized like a ch, ch, ch. This happens mostly regardless of specific dialects or regiolects, but some Germans might also verbalize it like a g because of their specific dialect. That is also possible. This applies to many g's inside of words or at the end, for instance in König, der König, or der König, the king. Both verbalizations are correct. The spelling stays the same anyway. 
Pretty much every person in every language has so-called trademark terms, meaning words that they use more often than others and that are pretty much unique to them and to their way of speaking, their idiolect, which is their own choice of words, basically their own word order here and there in spoken colloquial German, which might deviate from, well, the norm in a way and grammatical rules. And for Till, well, there's also one of those words that I could figure out, at least in this interview, and that is irgendwie, somehow. He likes to say that quite a lot. Dann ist die Akustik ziemlich extrem, weil sie bleibt halt in diesem Kessel. Weil sie bleibt halt in diesem Kessel. What's typically German here is the word order, which is wrong grammatically, but highly common like this in colloquial German. The introducing term of this Nebensatz, the subordinate clause, is the subjunction weil, because. However, syntactically Germans usually continue this type of Nebensatz as if it was a main clause, der Hauptsatz. Till says, weil sie bleibt halt in diesem Kessel. That is really typical German, but grammatically speaking, it's wrong. It's rather needed to be, weil sie halt in diesem Kessel bleibt. Like a subordinate clause, the verb is at the end. Also, this sentence features one of the most common German filler words, which also gets used subconsciously most of the time. Halt, which could get translated to, well, basically, or just, or simply. Das ist halt so. That simply is like that. Ich mag das nicht, wenn, wenn ich angeguckt werde. In spoken German, the negating particle nicht, not, often gets verbalized without the last T. This is not a general unspoken rule, but it's a very common phenomenon. So very often in spoken German, it's nicht instead of nicht. What's more normal in spoken German in general is the verbalization of the G like a K in gucken, to look or to watch, or here, angucken to look at something or someone. It's spelled with a G, but it's verbalized gucken with a K. Das ist ein, ist ein genialer Effekt mit, dem, mit, mit diesem Boot. Ich finde, das ist ein genialer Effekt mit diesem Boot. Here we're faced with the short form n for the masculine indefinite singular nominative article ein for der Effekt being a masculine noun. Again, it's also part of the contraction isn, meaning ist ein, is a. In this case, Till has left out the T at the end of ist, but it could also exist with that T, isten, instead of isn. Uh, also, wenn der nicht kommt, dann kriege ich mal schlechte Laune irgendwie. Also, Olli ist das Zentrum und bewegt sich da wirklich wie auf so einem Händemeer. Also, Olli ist das Zentrum und bewegt sich da wirklich wie auf so einem Händemeer. I chose this phrase to show you that using a language might be based on tendencies and common structures, but there can also be some, well, sort of irregularities, or inconsistencies, if you will. In this case, for instance, Till verbalized the G in bewegt like the actual G and not like a CH. Bewegt. A small but interesting detail when you consider that often, or like most of the time, he actually says ch instead of ge. Also, for instance, in parts of northern Germany, there is a sort of tendency to blur or to slur the vowel e in words to the extent that it rather reminds of a weak ö or ü. In this case, still has a slight tendency to say wirklich instead of wirklich, really. That is uh, the best effect, so den ich kenne eigentlich. Das ist uh, der beste Effekt, so den ich kenne eigentlich. Since he says that quite quickly, I can't really hear properly whether he says did or dat, but either way, both are colloquial, sort of dialect-based forms of the neuter, definite, singular, nominative and accusative article das. Did with a short unstressed e would be highly typical for the Berlin dialect, for instance. In the Ruhr area, in North Rhine-Westphalia, in the Ruhrgebiet, so to speak, many people also say dat instead of das. I actually do that as well, and people living in my region, which is the Sauerland, which is pretty close to the Ruhrgebiet. Den haben sie schon mal in die letzten Reihen hinten, wo keiner mehr war, und dann ist er auf die Erde gefahren und, und kam zurück und hat ein paar blaue Flecken. Den haben sie schon mal in die letzten Reihen hinten, wo keiner mehr war, und dann ist er auf die Erde gefallen und kam zurück und hatte ein paar blaue Flecken. A long phrase, but pretty interesting again. Hamse is another contraction, a colloquial combination of haben and sie, 
they have. For the third person plural, Präsens indicative mode active. Sie haben. The ending the is sie and it can also be found or used like that on its own in spoken German. Da sind sie. There they are. Is a is similar. It's a contraction of ist er. He is. And similar to the B in haben sie, here the consonant T gets dropped. Is a. The term blaue Flecken, blue spots, is the common German colloquial non-scientific term for a subcutaneous bluterguss, der bluterguss, singular, die blutergüsse, plural, the hematoma or effusion of blood. Manchmal kriegt man Gänsehaut. Manchmal kriegt man Gänsehaut. Last but not least, the sentence contains a word that's sort of similar to its English equivalent, and again it's the common colloquial non-scientific term for goosebumps, die Gänsehaut, literally the goose skin or geese skin. This video isn't about the origin of the band's name, the German town and military airbase Rammstein with one M and the related airshow accident in 1988 and all that, which is also interesting of course, but this one simply focuses on the linguistic side of it, the linguistic aspects, grammatical things, verbalization of letters, etc. And actually, talking about these things, the band's name is a good example of one of the most common German grammatical tools to create words, nouns, adjectives, you name them. Compound words. Combining single words to one new word, usually with a combined new semantic meaning. In the case of Rammstein, the first part or prefix syllable is Ram. As a noun, this term doesn't exist like that on its own, it's rather derived from the verb rammen, to ram, to drive against something, to hit or to crash. But of course, you could also nominalize this term to das rammen, the hitting or crashing. The second part is a common German masculine noun, der Stein, singular, die Steine, plural, the stone. So combined it would be the hit stone or crash stone. This could very well relate to cornerstones or other types of stones functioning in a protective way, similar to pillars that are installed to slow down cars or vehicles and immediately stop overly fast ones to prevent accidents and the like. Some interesting trivia for all you guys loving the German language and what makes it great. Even though it's not a compound term that gets used in everyday German, Germans can still immediately say, okay, it's a masculine noun and it has to feature the article der. In determinativ composita, determinating compound words, so to speak, which are the vast majority of compound words in German, the grammatical gender of the last part determines the grammatical gender for the whole compound word. So, since it's der Stein, a masculine noun, der is the masculine article here, the whole compound word Rammstein would be a masculine noun as well. Looking at the pronunciation, the verbalization of the different components of the band name, let's learn about some basic linguistic German features that can be found in the band name too, which actually make this band name a great German lesson on its own. The first one is the common standard German R, which in standard or high German, meaning non-dialectal German, doesn't get trilled the way Till does it in Rammstein songs. More about that though in a different video I've done, which can be found in the end card. There are three types of R sounds in German. So what I'm gonna talk about now is the common R in standard or high German as opposed to dialectal German. Please keep that in mind. The most common and standard German type of R is the R. A rather non-shrilled, non-rolled, slightly throaty type of R. Rammstein. Some fixed endings of terms, suffixes that end in R, might be verbalized way differently though. For instance, in a noun like der Lehrer, the teacher. As you might have noticed, the suffix er, e, er, rather gets verbalized like an a type of sound, der Lehrer. That's pretty much typical for German words with this suffix. What you might also have noticed is that the a in ram is rather short. That has to do with it being right in front of a double consonant, the two m. Now, when you have a vowel that's directly followed by a double consonant in German words, that vowel almost always gets verbalized short. So it's not Rammstein, but it's Rammstein. It's a little bit similar to the usual verbalization of the English to strum. Rammstein, to strum. And by the way, the aforementioned noun, der Lehrer, features the exact opposite to the double consonant rule, a prolonging, stressing H, which leads to the E in the first syllable of Lehrer to be pronounced long, 
Lehrer, not Lehrer. But continuing with Rammstein, the fixed consonant combination ST can be very tricky for learners, similar to SP, by the way, that combination. Because even though it looks quite obvious and simple, ST equals ST or SP equals SP. Well, that's usually not, not what this consonant combination gets verbalized like. In these combinations, the S gets verbalized like a SH combination. S-C-H, S-C-H, similar to the English S-H, SH. That's why it's not Stein, even though people from Hamburg might disagree here because of the dialectal form here. It's rather Stein. The fixed vowel combination EE, -E, being a diphthong, can be equally tricky, I guess. Even though it contains the German E, it gets verbalized as an A sound in this combination. So it's not Stein, but Stein. It's basically similar to the English term Schein with an additional T added in there. Stein. And when you have a term that features more than one syllable, like this one for instance, which features two, you also need to know which syllable gets stressed. And in this case, Rammstein. The stressing clearly lies on the first syllable. Ram. Rammstein. Not Rammstein. In this video, I'm gonna translate all titles of released Rammstein songs into English, from German, of course, their native language, which is mine as well. And I'm also gonna provide you with additional information whenever that fits, so you can also learn something along the way, because that is partially the purpose of this channel, of course, next to entertaining, I guess, I don't know. I will also translate the titles of, well, quite popular covers done by Rammstein into English or vice versa because there might also be some, well, English titles that could be translated to German instead. Well, let's just do that. So let's begin with the first one. Fünf Viertel, Five Fourth, first released on the Mutter single in 2002. A. A. Adios, meaning goodbye. In German, Tschüss, first released on the album Mutter, Mother in 2001. Alter Mann, for der Mann, singular, die Männer, plural, the man, old man or senior, on Sehnsucht, first released in 1997. Amerika, America, on Reise, Reise, 2004. Amour, the love, in English. Die Liebe, a feminine noun, also gets mentioned in the lyrics, released on Reise Reise. Asche zu Asche, for die Asche, singular, die Aschen, plural, the ash. Ashes to ashes, on Herzeleid, which is a poetic term. It basically means heartbreak and it was released in 1995 as the first Rammstein album. Ausländer, der Ausländer, singular, die Ausländer. Plural, the foreigner. It was released on Rammstein in 2019. B. B. Benzin. Das Benzin. Singular. Die Benzine. Plural. Gasoline or petrol. Released on Rosenrot in 2005. Bestrafe mich. Punish me. On Sehnsucht. Bück dich. Bend down or bend yourself down. On Sehnsucht. Bückstabü, which is a nonce word, it's a made-up term. It can mean everything and nothing according to the band. And by the way, a star like this icon would typically be called das Sternchen, the little star. It's a minimized form of der Stern, singular, die Sterne, plural, the star. This track was first released on Liebe ist für alle da, Love is there for everyone, in 2009. C. C. No Rammstein tunes to be found here. Yet. D. D. Dalai Lama. Nothing to translate here since it's der Name, singular. Die Namen, plural, the name. Then of course we're not talking about das Lama, singular. Die Lamas, plural, the Lama. No. Das alte Leid. For das Leid, only singular. Related terms are das Leiden, singular, die Leiden, plural, the suffering or distress. 
which basically means the old suffering or the old affliction in the sense of familiar. Actually, there's a quite similar German saying that goes immer das alte Lied. Well, same old song, pretty much. Der Meister. Plural die Meister. The master or champion. Das Model, which is a Kraftwerk cover. Das Model, singular. Die Models, plural. The model. Which was released on, well, who would have guessed it? Das Model, the single, in 1997. Deutschland, Germany, which was released on Rammstein in 2019. Diamant, der Diamant, singular, die Diamanten, plural, on Rammstein. Donaukinder, for the river, die Donau, the Danube. So the translated compound word is the Danube children, for das Kind, singular, die Kinder, plural. It was released on the special edition of Liebe ist für alle da. Du hast. You have. Sounding exactly the same as du hast with a double s, which means you hate. And all of that is the basis for the song's ambiguous lyrics, by the way. Du riechst so gut. You smell so good. On Herzeleid. E. E. Eifersucht. Mostly singular. Die Eifersucht. Singular. Die Eifersüchte. Plural. The jealousy. Ein Lied, das Lied, Singular, die Lieder, Plural, the song or tune, on Rosenrot. Engel, der Engel, Singular, die Engel, Plural, the angel. F, F, Feuer frei, das Feuer, Singular, die Feuer, Plural, the fire, and it basically means fire at will. Feuer und Wasser. Das Wasser, mostly singular, die Wasser, plural, fire and water. Feuerräder. The general term is das Feuerwerk though, and it's also the more common term. Das Feuerwerk, singular, die Feuerwerke, plural, the fireworks. And the term Feuerräder in specific rather translates to pinwheels. This track can be found on the Raritäten Rarities compilation, which was released in 2012. Frühling in Paris, der Frühling, the spring, spring in Paris. Führe mich, lead or guide me. G, G, gib mir deine Augen, das Auge, singular, die Augen, das Auge, singular, die Augen, plural, the eye, give me your eyes, which can be found on the Mein Herz brennt single, released in 2012. H, H, Haifisch, der Haifisch, singular, die Haifische, plural, the shark, literally the shark fish. Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Not too much to translate here, since it's a Hebrew term. This track can be found on the Lynx 234 single in 2001. Hallo Mann, literally translated Hello man, maybe referring to children's language, a man who says hello, basically, the hello man. Halt, stop, or halt. Heirate mich, marry me. Herzeleid, das Herzeleid, only singular, heartbreak. Hilf mir, help me. I, I, ich tu dir weh. I harm or hurt you, I'm harming or hurting you. Ich will, I want or I want to. J, J, nee. K, K, keine Lust, die Lust, singular, die Lüste, plural, the desire or delight, not in the mood or don't feel like it or can't be bothered. Klavier. Das Klavier, singular, die Klaviere, plural, the piano, which also exists in German. Das Piano, singular, die Pianos, plural. Kokain, das Kokain, and there is no plural term. Cocaine or Coke, which Germans might very well confuse with Coca-Cola. Küss mich, Fellfrosch. Kiss me, fur frog. Oh yeah, probably the weirdest Rammstein song title to date. Fellfrosch is a 
An interesting German term, to say the least, it is actually a slang term, a colloquial word, which refers to a hairy vagina. You're welcome. This compound word consists of the two parts das Fell, singular, die Felle, plural, the fur, and der Frosch, singular, die Frösche, plural, the frog. L, L, Leichtzeit, die Leichtzeit, singular, die Leichtzeiten, plural, the spawning season. Liebe ist für alle da. Die Liebe, no plural, although it's good to spend it in plural, if you know what I mean. Love is there or here, it exists for everyone, basically. Lise, no translation needed here since it's an older, rather outdated German girl name. Links 234, which could hypothetically also be called Links 234. So it could also be 2 instead of 2. Both relate to the same number though, the same digit, 2. So this is left 2, 3, 4, referring to a marching command in the military. Los. Doesn't really exist as a separate noun like this. It's rather a suffix of many German adjectives and the like. This is also the way it gets used in the lyrics. It's rather a part of a word than existing on its own. In certain contexts it could be an equivalent to go in the sense of let's go, los. M, M, M and M's. Mann gegen Mann, der Mann, singular, die Männer, plural, man versus or against man. Mehr, more. Mein Herz brennt. Das Herz, singular, die Herzen, plural, one of the recurring German terms in many of Till's lyrics. My heart burns. Mein Land, das Land, singular, die Länder, plural, the country, my country, which can be found on the Made in Germany 1995-2011 to compilation. Morgenstern, der Morgenstern, singular, die Morgensterne, plural, the literal translation morning star sounds so innocent, but a Morgenstern can also, well, refer to this, a maze. Ouch! Moscow. This is the German name or spelling for Moscow, the capital city of Russland, Russia. Mutter. Die Mutter, singular. Die Mutter, plural. The mother. N. N. Nebel, der Nebel, singular, die Nebel, plural, the fog or mist. O, oh, O, oh, ohne dich, without you. P, P, Puppe, die Puppe, singular, die Puppen, plural, the puppet or doll. And of course, Pussy which either is die Mieze, singular, die Miezen, plural, a colloquial term for a female cat, or rather vulgar die Muschi, singular, die Muschis, plural, which is a slang term for the vagina, which in turn can also mean cute cat. Yeah, welcome to the German language. Kuh, Q. Ah, uh, forget about it. Er, R, or as Till might put it, R. Radio, das Radio, singular, die Radios, plural, the radio. Ramlied, could be translated to ram song or ramming song, or drive against song, which hits you like a wrecking ball of sorts. Rammstein. Similar to Ramlied, this could be translated to Ramstone. It's der Stein, singular, die Steine, plural, the stone. Rein, raus, in, out, or into, out of. Both are slightly shortened forms of the adverbs herein, in and heraus, out. Reise, reise. Although it reads and sounds exactly like die Reise, singular, die Reisen, plural, the journey or trip, this title is rather a reference and related to a Reis, a Reis, basically an old wake-up term in the military. Rosenrot, 
a German compound word which consists of a noun and an adjective. Die Rose, singular, die Rosen, plural, the rose, and the color rot, respectively the noun das rot, red, the red of roses. Roter Sand, der Sand, almost always in singular, die Sande, plural, the sand, red sand. S, S. Well, a little break in between these two letters might be better. Seemann, der Seemann, singular, die Seemänner, plural, the sailor. Sehnsucht, die Sehnsucht, singular, die Sehnsüchte, plural, the desire or longing. Sex, der Sex, no plural, oh no, sex, or sexual intercourse. Sonne, die Sonne, singular, die Sonnen, plural, the sun. Spiel mit mir, play with me. Spieluhr, die Spieluhr, singular, die Spieluhren, plural, the music box. The literal German translation of this term is the play clock, since, well, it plays a melody, I guess. Spring. Not to be confused with the English season term spring, which is der Frühling in German. Here it's meant as a demand or order. Jump! The infinite verb is springen, to jump. It's not a happy jump though in this case, since the lyrics deal with a potential suicide caused by jumping from a bridge. Stein um Stein. Stone by or stone after stone. Stirb nicht vor mir. Which is an easy one for you guys, since the full title already contains the whole translation. Don't die before I do. On a personal note, regarding Rammstein songs, I think this is one of their most underrated songs to date. Stripped. A Depeche Mode cover. Basically referring to being nackt. Naked. Released on the Stripped single in 1998. T. T. Tattoo. Das Tattoo, singular, die Tattoos, plural, the tattoo. Te quiero puta, Spanish for I love you whore, which is ich liebe dich hure in German, for die hure, singular, die huren, plural, as a vulgar slang term for die prostituierte, singular, die prostituierten, plural, the prostitute. Tier, das Tier, singular, die Tiere, plural, Animal. Doesn't have anything to do with a subscription tier on Patreon or wherever. U. U. Mm -mm. V. V. Vergiss uns nicht. Don't forget about us or don't forget us. Might also be sort of related to the flower vergiss mein nicht, forget mein not or forget me not. Translated literally. Released on the Mein Land single in 2011. V. W. Weidmanns Heil. Usually written as one word, it serves as a typical German greeting or salutation among der Jäger, singular, die Jäger, plural, the huntsman. Was ich liebe, what I love. Weißes Fleisch. Would be spelled Weißes Fleisch nowadays, so the sound is exactly the same, since there was a change in the spelling of many words with double S, taking action in 1996, one year after the album Herzleid was released. Also, it's Das Fleisch, only in singular, which in Germany is used for both flesh, in the sense of human flesh, and meat, animal meat, so it's white flesh or white meat. Weit weg, far away. Wiener Blut, Vienna blood, or Vienna's blood, for das Blut, no plural, the blood. Wiener with er at the end is an inflected form of the town name Wien, which you know as Vienna, the capital city of Österreich, Austria. Wilder Wein, der Wein, singular, die Weine, plural, the wine. Wild wine, referring to die Jungfernrebe, the woodbine or creeper. Wo bist du? Where are you? Wollt ihr das Bett in Flammen sehen? 
a very serious and important question every German grows up with and is quite familiar with. Not really. Das Bett, Singular, die Betten, Plural, the Bett, die Flamme, Singular, die Flammen, Plural, the Flame. Do you want to see the bed in flames? X, X, and Y, Y. Nothing found in these folders, no. And last but not least, Z, Z or Z. Zeig dich, show or reveal yourself. Zerstören, destroy or destroying. Almost another one of those hidden Rammstein gems, so to speak, and definitely one of my favorites on the Rosenrot record. Zwitter, der Zwitter, Singular, die Zwitter, Plural, Hermaphrodite or Hybrid. The album's title is the same as the first single. It's an eponymously titled album, so to speak. It's Die Zeit, Singular, Die Zeiten. Plural, the time. Before I'm gonna dive into the song's titles, if you like Rammstein, I guess you do if you're watching this video, and you enjoy the German language and culture, and you want to learn more about that, maybe even in a combination of both, this channel might be interesting for you, just saying. And to be honest with you guys, you can say what you want about Rammstein and their aesthetics, you know, their look, their appearance. Maybe you might not even be the biggest fan of the band, but there's one thing you can't deny, which is, in this case especially, once again, the marketing behind the album promotion cycles and all that kind of stuff, the band itself, you know, that is top notch. And in this case, which is fitting to both the album's name and maybe overarching topic, who knows, and the reveal of the song titles. There were rumors, but we didn't know if they were true. And then the band announced that they have hidden 11 time capsules all across the globe. So that is such a neat idea. And finally, we don't have to rely on low resolution screenshot images anymore, because here it is. And by the way, the German term die Zeitkapsel, singular, die Zeitkapseln, plural, the time capsule, is a literal translation, because we can, I guess. Overall, looking at the song titles in addition to the cool album artwork, I get a feeling of anger, danger, but also thought-provoking topics, maybe even with political or socially critical implications here and there. Especially song number nine. The first song, the opener of the album, is called Armee der Tristen, Army of the Trist, Sad or Dull Ones. When I as a German perceive the adjective Trist, dreary, I'm thinking of something that's sort of underachieving, a place or mood that is sort of sterile, monotone, hopeless, sad, left alone, abandoned. My guess is that maybe this song isn't about an actual army, the army, singular, the army, plural, the army. Or maybe it might also refer to, you know, an army that fights a fight, a battle, a war, that they actually don't know too much about. And because of the potential military-like context, in terms of the title at least, I could see fit a sort of marching type of rhythm, similar to the one in Links 234, for instance. I guess it would certainly fit. Also, keep in mind that this is the opener of the album, meaning this could be a really energetic song to really get you going right away. As I've already mentioned, I've already tackled the song Zeit by Rammstein in multiple videos. You can find them in the end card. That is why I'm not gonna talk about that one too much here. But what I can repeatedly say actually is, with Zeit, Till Lindemann, being the lyricist, has outdone himself in my opinion. I think Zeit is one of the most profound, deepest, thought-provoking, maybe even philosophical songs he has written to date. Wow. The, I was deeply impressed by that actually. Therefore, let's move on to track number 3, which is called <laughs> Schwarz Black. And of course, another potential perfect opportunity for Till as a singer to trill, to roll the R, the German R. But maybe he won't do that, because sometimes he doesn't. Anyway, I've talked about Till Lindemann trilling the R in a respective other video as well. So if you're interested in that and learning more about that, why he does that and what that is all about, feel free to check that out in the end card. I love how sometimes a single word and in a creative certain context, in this case the band and their connotations, allows for much interpretation. Maybe the lyrical eye is talking about pessimism, in analogy to the German phrase dafür sehe ich schwarz. 
Literally, I'm seeing black for that. Meaning, I can't think of a positive outcome. I don't see it's gonna work out in any way, shape or form. I'm sorry. That may be an interesting topic. If you were to refer to schwarz as a noun, by the way, it would be a neuter noun, das schwarz, which applies to all colors as nouns in German, by the way. A neat little German language hack, so to speak. I hope listening to the album won't be this, giftig, song number four, poisonous or venomous. Apart from this song's potential context, the title is also interesting linguistically speaking. In German, we'd use giftig for both poisonous, you take in the poison when you eat something, and venomous, commonly used for animals that sting or bite to inject their poison. The same relation, respectively semantic difference, applies to the noun das Gift, singular, die Gifte, plural, the poison or venom, which is not in any case to be confused with the English gift, which is das Geschenk, singular, die Geschenke, plural, in German. Believe me, you don't want to gift someone a German gift. Uh, no, you don't. In German, we also use the expression da ist aber jemand giftig in the sense of someone having a temper. For instance, a parent might say that to a really angry child when it is overly angry for no profound reason, especially. And on a side note, I predict Till may be using the original or a variation of the phrase die Dosis macht das Gift. The dose makes the poison. Because it just sounds like a line he would use. This phrase means that certain things are only poisonous or venomous when you consume a certain amount, large amount of them. I think that may be something he would include in some way, but we'll see. I'm recording this in late March of 2022, so I don't know if the rumors are true that Zickzack, song number 5, might be the second single off of the album. Zickzack! In this case, you may have been able to guess its meaning already, since it's similar to the English zigzag. And, yep, it means the same. This title not only refers to visual patterns or someone walking in a zigzag motion, for instance, because they are drunk as hell, and but it may as well refer to someone who has trouble having a steady opinion on something or someone. Today, they may think highly of someone, you know, and favor something, and the next day, they hate that or them, and they think the other way around. You can't really trust them, therefore, and their opinion. There's also a sort of related German phrase, der or die fährt einen ziemlichen Zickzackkurs. He or she really drives a strong zigzag route, which actually applies to both mentioned potential scenarios. I hope it will be more than that, but maybe track number six will just be okay. Yeah, we Germans also use that. We also say okay multiple times a day. It's really common. And also, this song title reminds me of another German rock song, which is also really cool. That song, OK by Farin Urlaub, is about someone, the lyrical eye, who is having a really bad time because of someone else that was close to them before. And the lyrical eye blames the other person for that and for being the origin of them feeling so bad. Maybe this is a similar song, maybe not, who knows. If OK was less than okay, which I hope it won't be, you might see Meine Tränen, song number seven, My Tears, <laughs> but maybe not. It's die Träne, singular, die Tränen, plural, the tear, a term Till has used quite a few times before, maybe most prominently in the song Haifisch, which I've also analyzed before. However, even though we may think of tears as tears of sadness at first, that doesn't have to be the case, of course, because Tränen could as well be Freudentränen, tears of joy. Maybe even both combined in one song, both perspectives. Or maybe it's just a song about crying when cutting onions. You know, it's interesting, if I were to come up with a list of potential fitting Rammstein-like song titles that I could see fit as a German, that would just fit Rammstein's attitude and their approach to naming songs and dealing with lyrics, you know, and that kind of stuff. This one, the next one, song number eight, Angst, would definitely be on that list. You know, single word, a noun. Rammstein also loved to just use nouns as song titles. Haifisch, Till Lindemann likes to use that, respectively, the band. It's Die Angst, singular, Die Ängste, 
plural, the fear. I could see fit that Till would write lyrics about being afraid of being afraid, basically a meta type of song, and about how irrational fear actually is, yet how pretty much all of us still experience it. And sometimes fear may even prevent you from doing something stupid or dangerous, so it could as well have positive implications. And now to a song title that kinda seems out of place in direct comparison, but maybe it will fit lyrically speaking? I don't know yet. It's interesting to say the least. Dear ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you the new Rammstein song, very elaborate, very thought-provoking as well. It is called Dicke Titten. You might be wondering what that is all about. Well, Dicke Titten means thick tits. <laughs> Big boobs. And I'm not kidding. No. It literally means that. It's just, I, yeah, it's just a typical Rammstein song title in my book. But it sort of feels out of place amidst the other potentially more serious songs. And by the way, it doesn't have anything to do with the tit, the bird. It, 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 no. Similar to the slang term boobs or tits, the German term die Titten is a vulgar slang variant of die Brüste. But who knows, maybe it's not about that. It's about some something else that we all don't know about that is also called Titten. Maybe a technical term, maybe a philosophical thesis. And if indeed that last song, Dicke Titten, isn't about what it seems to be about, just making us think of Dicke Titten might have been a Lüge, a lie. The cake is a lie, the tit is a lie. Because song number 10 is titled Lügen, lies. Or to lie, as a nominalized verb, basically. I definitely could see fit that this one may address certain political things or how powerful a well thought out lie can be. Because, you know, as we all know by now and in recent years, just keep repeating it over and over again and in people's minds it may become a truth, even though it's just a lie disguised as the truth. It doesn't change just because you repeat it a million times. It's die Lüge, singular, die Lügen, plural, the lie. And the last song title, which made uh, certain German fans quite sad, actually. And I don't know if it has to mean something like that or not, but it's adieu. Which of course means goodbye. Is it the goodbye of the band? Is it the last album? Is it the last song they will ever release as Rammstein? However, when you think about it, they already had Adios on Mutter, which was released 21 years ago, and that was not quite a goodbye for the band either. So it doesn't have to mean anything, of course. Maybe this time it is. We don't know. The actual German equivalent of this term would be Tschüss, goodbye. Or for instance, Mach es gut, goodbye, more literally speaking, you know, make it good. But of course, let's hope it's not that for the band. Some of you guys watching this might already be familiar with my various other Rammstein related videos on this channel, ranging from the background of band members to English translations and explanations of the original German lyrics. I truly think pretty much every Rammstein song works well for learning German, however, that being said, there are certain more poetic and literally abstract songs that rather require an advanced understanding of German words and phrases, for instance in terms of their ambiguity. So which Rammstein songs are suited best for people that are just beginning to learn German. When you are a fresh beginner and you don't want to feel overstrained right away, I'd personally suggest starting with a song like Du Hast. Not only because it's one of the guy's most popular hits, of course it is, but primarily because even though the lyrics are quite short, they manage to be basic yet also feature a few interesting linguistic features, basic German language features. I'm not gonna go into full detail here when it comes to this song because I've already done that before. You can find a link to that video in the end card, but just look at the first verse. What it looks like being written out. That alone tells a lot. Du, du hast, du hast mich, du hast mich gefragt, du hast mich gefragt, du hast mich gefragt und ich habe nichts gesagt. The German personal pronoun and informal form of address in singular, du, is a very important and basic feature in daily German talk. It can be inflected, but here it's the standard form in nominative. 
Just speaking in terms of syntax and the general word order, du hast could be an example of a minimum ingredient sentence. It features everything you need to have for a proper German sentence. Subject plus verb. In this case though, it's a bit special because hast is an auxiliary verb. It gets used here because of the tense, which becomes more obvious in the following lines. Du hast mich gefragt. Is a sentence in the perfect, the present perfect tense. It's a past tense in German. To express an action in this past tense, perfect, you have to use respectively conjugated forms of the auxiliary verb haben and a directly related past participle. Here, gefragt, asked. Du hast mich gefragt. You have asked me. The personal pronoun, mich, accusative singular, me, usually gets inserted between hast and gefragt. The final line in the pre-chorus features two Hauptsätze, der Hauptsatz, the main clause, which are connected by probably the most often and most commonly used German conjunction, und, and. In the chorus you can also see the typical German sentence structure for a question, with the verb being featured at the beginning. These are a few reasons why I personally would say this one is one of the best entry points for, well, German beginners, learners of the German language that just started learning German. The lyrics aren't too complex yet compelling, they are simple yet not dumb. There is more to them than meets the eye in some cases here and there, especially also to the title because it's very ambiguous. But more about that as I've said before in my dedicated video about Du hast. Du hast mich. I'd also recommend starting to learn German with keine Lust. Grammatically speaking, the lyrics also feature the German auxiliary verb haben in various facets, including a colloquial short version, hab instead of habe, the ordinary habe in indicative mode and hätte, would have, in conjugative mode. Whereas in du hast, the lyrical perspective is rather focused on the du, meaning addressing someone else, keine Lust, centered around the ich, I and expressions from the lyrical eye's own perspective. Of course, another popular Rammstein tune in that vein is Ich Will, and that song is also really well suited for learning German as a beginner. One term that is undoubtedly really well and really closely connected to Rammstein and their songs, their lyrics, is one that I really need to start with and really need to mention, therefore, it's Feuer. It's a German neuter noun, which is spelled and pronounced the same way in singular and plural. Das Feuer, Singular, die Feuer, Plural, the fire. So it's the context and the grammatical structure surrounding it that tell us if it's just one or multiple fires. The first tune that might come to your mind featuring this noun also surely is the one with the most direct and foreground-like use of it. Feuer frei, a single released of their third album Mutter from 2001. Feuer frei translates to fire free, literally. It means start firing or simple fire or fire at will as an English demand and order. When soldiers shoot a target, the general might say Feuer or Feuer frei, fire at will. So once more, we have an interesting ambiguity in an audiovisual way here. Literally speaking in the song itself, but especially in the music video, this could also be translated and interpreted as release the flames, release the fire. And generally speaking, this song, Feuer frei, is loaded and packed with terms that refer to flames, fire, burning and the like. Other Rammstein tunes which feature this linguistic set of expressions include Asche zu Asche, Ashes to Ashes, Mein Herz brennt, My Heart Burns, Benzin, Gas or Fuel, Feuer und Wasser, Fire and Water, or Wollt ihr das Bett in Flammen sehen? Do you want to see the bed in flames? But why does Till use this term so often? I guess one big reason is that he just has a huge affinity to fire as an enigmatic and fascinating element. I mean, He's a trained pyrotechnician after all, and that clearly shows in many of Rammstein's music videos and live shows. A second reason I can see fit is that it's simply a multi-layered and very ambiguous term which fits many different contexts. Fire represents a mixture of warmth, love, but also danger or even death. It's a very broad imagery one can create with it, so to speak. So maybe you do have another idea why Till is fascinated by the metaphor of fire and burning. If so, tell us in the comments. 
The second seemingly ordinary, but then again quite meaningful German term, I think at least, can be found in many Rammstein tracks as well. It's Kind. Which can be found in lines like these. Gefährlich das gebrannte Kind. Dangerous is the burnt child. Ein Kind stirbt. A child dies or is dying. Und aus der Erde singt das Kind. And out of or from the earth the child sings. An Bord ist auch ein Mann mit Kind. A man and his child are on board too. Bringt mir dieses Menschenkind. Bring me this human child, which is an old, outdated and rather poetically used term nowadays. I'm sure Till chose this word not only because it really stands out because of its unusualness, so to speak, but also because the lyrics to Dalai Lama are based on the ballad Der Erlkönig, which was written by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe in 1782. Ein blindes Kind, das vorwärts kriecht. A blind child that crawls forward. I especially like this term in the context of Rammstein songs because to me it works as a morbid and pretty strangely interesting mixture of innocence on the one side and danger or even death on the other side. Most if not all references of or to the term Kind in Rammstein tracks are somewhat tilted to an obscure or even bad context. Suffering, death, acting willless, a lost future with so much more that could have been losing innocence and the like. In the song Hallo Mann, Hello Man, a child gets abducted and is supposedly or even getting forced to dance and sing. In Rammstein, the line Ein Kind stirbt, a child is dying or dies, well, is pretty much the previous stage to that in a way. In Dalai Lama, the child is on a plane with his father when the plane crashes out of turbulences, storms, etc. and it eventually uh, dies. In Du riechst so gut, you smell so good, the child is blind and crawls forward and in the song Spieluhr, music box, the child is already dead and alone in their grave and it even sings in the chorus. Mein Herz schlägt nicht mehr weiter, my heart doesn't beat anymore. Which, interestingly enough, leads us to the third and last term in this list in this video today, which is Herz. Mein Herz brennt, my heart burns or is burning. Kann man Herzen brechen? Can one break hearts? Probably the Rammstein song which features the term most often. Im Geist getrennt, im Herz vereint. Separated in spirit, meaning cognitively. United in the heart, meaning emotionally. Das kleine Herz stand still für Stunden. The little heart stood still or had stopped for hours. Sechs Herzen, die brennen. Six hearts that burn. Again, a very bilateral term in general and also in Rammstein's lyrics. It rather has a pretty positive and pure connection to it, referring to love, a close bond and relationship and these kinds of things. This becomes quite obvious in the song Haifisch, when the lyrical eye sings Sechs Herzen, die brennen, das Feuer hält euch warm, Six hearts that burn, the fire keeps you warm, obviously referring to the six band members. Burning might mean both being alive and feeling great about that and also burning for something, have a huge interest in pursuing certain actions, hobbies and things. You're motivated and really invested. Sie wollen mein Herz am rechten Fleck, doch sehe ich dann nach unten weg, da schwebt es links. They want my heart at the right spot, but I look down then and it levitates left which, in context of the song, is a purposely made political statement against the recurring accusations of being a right-wing band, because of Till's rolled R and the like, I guess, but it also uses the metaphor of the heart as something really precious and valuable that is totally worth to be protected. In the comeback song Deutschland, the contrast im Geist getrennt, im Herz vereint, relates to the feeling many Germans have had about their national identity in regards to dark passages in Germany's past. Germans might deal and think about things very differently, but in their hearts they still relate and are German nonetheless at the end of the day. But first of all, before we're gonna dive deep into a couple of examples, let's actually talk about what semantic ambiguity actually means. The adjective semantic, semantisch in German, is a linguistic term for meaning-wise or meaning-related. Die Semantik, the semantics, is all about the combination of a, a term, 
and b the associated and expressed meaning. Whereas many terms carry one specific meaning, other words have developed at least one additional meaning which applies to specific situations. That's also why the context is a very important factor in everything related to the ambiguität, the ambiguity. Which arguably is a rather linguistic technical term, commonly known as die Doppeldeutigkeit, the double meaning of a term, or die Mehrdeutigkeit, the multiple meanings of a term. To be fair, an ambiguity can also occur by accident, meaning without any intention of having it there, but in the case of lyricism, I think it's very likely that almost all ambiguous expressions have been put in these texts on purpose. The first example for a well-rounded and also quite specific ambiguity can be found in the 1997 Rammstein hit song Du hast. The first verse starts with the three-part line structure Du, Du hast, Du hast mich. You, you have, you have me. Now, you might be a bit surprised to hear me say this, but in written form, there is no ambiguity here at all. The double meaning of the phrase du hast mich is based on the phonetic side of things, meaning the sound of this expression just when you hear it. The key word in this one is hast. It's the second person, singular, simple present indicative active form of the verb haben, to have got. That's why du hast mich translates to you have me, or you have got me. However, we also have a German verb hassen, which means to hate. It might as well be referred to as a phrasal verb. Jemanden hassen, to hate someone. The analog conjugated verb form of hassen in this context would be du hast mich. As we can clearly see, this verb contains a double s, which isn't true for the aforementioned hast. In other words, we have a clear difference in the spelling. Both conjugated verbs sound exactly the same. That's why this particular example is something like a semantic tonal ambiguity, if you will. You basically need to know more about the context in order to be able to decide whether this is supposed to mean haben, to have, or hassen, to hate. In the context of this song, which seems to deal with questions of loving each other, or, well, not so much, being together and a potential soon-to-happen marriage, plus the knowledge that the following line continues as Du hast mich gefragt und ich hab nichts gesagt. You have asked me and I didn't say anything. This could either lead to A. You have asked me whether I'd like to marry you, but I'm not positive and I'm not interested, and slash or B. You hate me, yet you're somewhat in love with me, and you even want to marry me. What the hell? There are more things about the rest of the lyrics and the music video accompanying the track that could be said here, but since I've already made a whole dedicated video about this song and its lyrics, what they translate to in English and more, I'd suggest watching that video for more information on Du hast. Just click the linked video during the end card of this video. The next example can be found in the 2004 hit single America. It's a rather sarcastic song about America's imperialist tendencies, especially on an economic and political level. Since it is intended to be an ironic song which criticizes these things lyrically, you can find many subtle and indirect references to these just mentioned and other things. Let's take a look at the second verse. We got two interlinked lines that go Und wer nicht tanzen will am Schluss, weiß noch nicht, dass er tanzen muss. And to those who don't wanna dance at or in the end, don't know they, literal translation he, er, probably meaning prominent male politicians at the time, such as Iraq's former president Saddam Hussein, will have to dance. In the German language, the verb tanzen usually is a neutral and even positive verb. It means to dance. I mean, that's fun, I guess. But here, this meaning only fits the surface, the superficial level of the lyrics, so to speak, which seem to be quite bright and positive at first sight. I mean, the lyrics even mention Mickey Mouse, yeah, in standing in front of Paris, woohoo, the city of love. Great. This refers to the idea of America exporting their big cultural impacts and the entertaining industry to the whole world. Embedded in this specific critical context, dancing isn't meant positive at all. But in order to comprehend this ambiguity, which is based on having a light superficial positive meaning and a deeper critical level of the lyrics, we also need to know about a certain German idiom. It goes, nach meiner Pfeife tanzen, to dance according to my whistle. 
translated literally, meaning to act and live according to my standards and rules without discussing or reflecting on that. Just do it. An English equivalent would be to dance to someone's tune or bidding. So with this background knowledge in mind, the lyrics lead to thoughts like we have to force our will and morals upon these leaders and countries we've evaluated as being dangerous for the world or even maybe just for us. This semantic background might explain the translation and the use of the phrase containing a seemingly innocent verb like tanzen a bit more clearly. The third and final example, at least in this video, is a quite recent one because it was actually mentioned and used in the new Rammstein song Deutschland, Germany, which I've already made a couple of videos about, but I haven't really tackled on this example right here. So let's find out what could be ambiguous in the lyrics to this song. The second half of the verse features many terms beginning with the prefix über, which can mean above or over something or someone. It also exists as a totally separate preposition. Uh, da hängt eine Spinne über dir. Uh, there's a spider hanging over you. Oh no. The three lines I'm gonna talk about feature two of these terms each, which are semantically related or seemingly opposed to each other. They either are verbs or adjectives. Überheblich. Überlegen. Übernehmen. Übergeben. Überraschen. Überfallen, arrogant, superior, taking over, handing over, surprising, raiding or hijacking. Along with reading or hearing the adjective überheblich, arrogant, the adjective überlegen implies the meaning of to be superior, meaning to be above things. And while this indeed works perfectly fine for the intended meaning, referring to certain areas of Germany's troublesome history, especially the Third Reich and the Nazi ideology of being superior to everyone and those kinds of things, überlegen could also be comprehended as the infinite verb that looks, reads and sounds exactly the same. Überlegen. To think about or reflect on something. In this sense, both words combined could also imply überheblich überlegen to think about something in a superior or arrogant manner. The first verb in the second line, übernehmen, can mean to take over something. For instance, taking over meaning adopting something and continuing a task from someone else who has pursued this activity before. Or in the context of the song, conquering other nations and countries, basically absorbing and annexing them and making them a part of your own territory by defeating them in a battle or war. However, there is a German expression that goes sich mit etwas übernommen haben or sich mit etwas übernehmen. Here the conjugated respectively the infinite verb übernehmen means to overextend oneself on something. You have evaluated your possibilities and capabilities wrongly and the task you chose turns out to be too big or too complex or too difficult or simply impossible for you to master and work on. The word übergeben is another verb, which means to hand over something to someone else, for instance in the sense of giving away and delegating a task to someone else. But it can also mean uh, to vomit, depending on the context. In that case it could also very well be a phrasal verb, sich übergeben, oneself having to vomit. Ich muss mich übergeben. As you might have noticed, you wouldn't translate the reflexive pronoun sich or mich in this case to English. So this meaning in the context of the song could refer to an increased weakness and vulnerability of a big conquering nation for instance that has absorbed many territories, but now this new situation might also lead to even more enemies, to even bigger problems and riots, civil wars or the like. From the perspective of the conquering country, this dangerous and unwanted or even unforeseeable weakened situation might have resulted from a task which was too impossible or impractical to begin with, but out of ideological reasons and beliefs, all this was tried and done nonetheless. So the first German Sprichwort, das Sprichwort Singular, die Sprichwörter Plural, I want to talk about today is quite old, but it can be found in a rather new Rammstein song. In the 2019 Rammstein comeback song Deutschland, Germany, singer Till Linnemann ends the second verse with the phrase Wer hochsteigt, der wird tief fallen. This phrase translates to something like One who rises up will fall deep down, and it's basically meant to be a warning or a sort of negative prophecy. 
If you act too full of yourself or if you feel way too powerful and mighty without having the danger of that in mind, your demise or fall will be especially hard and heavy. Related terms would be überheblich, which also gets mentioned in the song, arrogant or big-headed, ehrgeizig, ambitious and übertreiben, to exaggerate. This one though is a slightly different variant of the standard form of this saying, wer hochsteigt kann tief fallen. If you climb high, you can fall low. In the context of the song, it of course somewhat tells of Germany's not so glorified history, including what we would call Allmachtsfantasien, fantasies of unlimited power and world domination. The second Sprichwort I'm gonna tackle in this video can also be found in a relatively new Rammstein track. Wer schön sein muss, der will auch leiden is part of the Rammstein track Tattoo. And well, to solve the quote unquote riddle about the video's title, this phrase is sort of twisted or switched up in comparison to what the original German proverb is like. The phrase, wer schön sein muss, der will auch leiden, translates to, who needs to be beautiful also wants to suffer, which fits the context of the song that's about an affinity towards getting and having tattoos, so in these lyrics Till has basically swapped keywords in order to create a slightly tilted but fitting meaning. The common form of this phrase is, wer schön sein will, muss leiden, who wants to be beautiful needs to suffer, which also would fit the song quite well. So, in direct comparison, the two conjugated modal verbs muss, needs to, with the infinite form müssen, and will, wants to, with the infinite form wollen, are swapped here. But of course, the question is, why did singer and lyricist Till Lindemann do this? Why did he kinda switch things here? Well, my clever, or maybe not so clever guess, would be that I don't have a tattoo myself, but I could imagine that getting a tattoo is sort of related to a love-hate relationship and love-hate thoughts about the process, the needle work, so to speak, the pain that you feel, because even though I guess many people don't really like the pain and the feeling when they get a tattoo, there are still many people as well that I have heard of or I know of personally that really love that feeling. I guess this is what this developed form of the saying might be all about. Well, yeah, some people really enjoy this process up to the point of experiencing some kind of satisfaction or lust when they feel the pain. They basically want to suffer in order to become more beautiful, at least in their own eyes. Interestingly enough, though, it's not clear where the origin of this German saying actually lies. It seems to have been coined in the 19th century AD at least. Last but not least, at least for this video, let's go way back, let's say to the year 2005. That was 14 years ago. That just occurred to me, because back then Rammstein released both a single and their fifth album with the same name, Rosenrot, the Red of Roses. The chorus of the song culminates in the expression Tiefe Wasser sind nicht still, deep waters are in silence, which comes full circle with the beginning of the chorus, which goes Tiefe Brunnen muss man graben, wenn man klares Wasser will. You have to dig deep wells if you want clear water, which in the context of the song I'd say means something like, well, in order to get really behind someone's personality and their thoughts, feelings, whatever, you have to crack the surface and really break the ice quite heavily. You have to dig deep. This whole idea and the lyrics are related to the German idiom Stille Wasser sind tief. Silent waters are deep. Translated literally. The actual equivalent would be still waters run dry. The original German version is used for situations in which you are surprised by someone's reaction, thoughts or character traits. I guess the most fitting example might be a very introverted person who still manages to speak up and voice their opinion out loud. And you didn't see that coming whatsoever. So the first track that came to my mind when I thought, you know, this might be a pretty interesting video idea, I don't know, not just for me but also for you guys maybe, because you can learn some more about how clever 
some Rammstein lyrics can be. Well, in fact, most of them, I'd say. It's a sort of a hidden gem song in a way. Maybe also quite underrated. I'm talking about Spieluhr, Music Box. It's the seventh song on the third Rammstein record, Mutter, Mother. Even though this song seems to be a bit under the radar in terms of or in comparison with other Rammstein tracks, I really like many of the lines in this one. The actually really creepy yet fascinating topic about a little child who was thought to be dead and therefore wrongfully buried, well, that is something uh, special in a way. After having woken up inside their grave, well, they start a music box which in turn allows them to be freed in the end. This gets especially mentioned in the lines, als der Frost ins Kind geflogen, hat es die Spieluhr aufgezogen. As the frost or coldness flew into the child, it wound up the music box. These lines do not only feature the main item of the song, which is die Spieluhr, singular, die Spieluhren, plural, the music box, literally the play clock, but it's also introduced by a very poetic phrase, which could be sort of extracted like this. Der Frost ist in dich geflogen. The frost has flown into you, quite literally. Der Frost, singular, die Fröste, plural, the frost. This is an unusual poetic phrasing, but it perfectly works in the context of this specific situation. It has come to life again, maybe actually because of die Kälte, the coldness. Aufgezogen is a related form of aufziehen, to wind up, and it's a closely connected verb to the noun Spieluhr. And together you have the phrase die Spieluhr aufziehen, to wind up the music box. Another simple yet very figurative line is eine Melodie im Wind, a melody in the wind. Could sound romantic and all, but in the context of this track the warm melody of living is carried on a cold, lonely wind of winter and death. The following two lines are a primary example for how violent and explicit, yet very well elegant and poetic in a way, lyrics can be. Alle Nägel stehen stramm, wenn ich sie in dein Leibholz ramm. All nails are standing straight as I ram them into your body wood. The made up compound term Leibholz is a really cool metaphor in the song Stein um Stein, which is the 10th song on Rammstein's fourth album Reise Reise. And since we're talking about the awesome German language, you can even inflect it, even though it's completely made up. So there you go. It's das Leibholz, singular, die Leibhölzer, plural. I'd say it's a rather idiomatic term, which means it can only or let's say rather be understood in the context of this song only. And not anywhere else, because wouldn't make too much sense and you don't have enough context to understand what it's supposed to mean. So if you just heard it or read it on its own without having any additional context, it might be very difficult to decipher. It combines the two normal nouns der Leib, singular, die Leiber, plural, the body, and das Holz, singular, die Hölzer, plural, the wood. It certainly could be interpreted as a reference to a, well, crucified person hanging on a wooden cross for instance, especially in combination with the straight standing nails, which were hammered into limbs and stuff for instance, since the track is about someone who actually breaks in another, alive, person, the song's title translates to stone by stone, by the way. The lyrical eye might be so full of hatred or false love that they don't see the other person as a human being, but rather as part of the structure, work or the building. Generally speaking about this tune, I really, really love the both lyrical and musical climax towards the end of the song when these lines are actually sung. It sounds so majestic in a way. It, it, it's really, really, really a uh, pretty cool song. Also, maybe sort of an underrated one. I don't know. So the last example, at least in this video, pretty much is the entirety of Rosenrot, the song, the Red of Roses. Not just because roses are cool, all the lyrics in this one are very poetic and very elegant in a way. 
linguistically elegant, I'd say. Since I can't really talk about the song as a whole in this one, because this would, well, sort of burst at the seams. I will talk about it, however, in a future video, don't worry. Let's just begin with the first two lines. Rosenrot is the third song on the eponymous fifth Rammstein album released in 2005. And, well, even though the title is very, you know, obvious in a way, for a quite long time, many years ago, I actually got the first verse wrong. The first two lines go, sah ein Mädchen ein Röslein stehen, blühte dort in lichten Höhen. A girl saw a standing rosy or little rose or like a rose standing there, blooming there in clear or bright heights. And back in the day I thought the poetic minimized noun das Röslein, singular, die Röslein, plural, would refer to a little horse, das Pferd, singular, die Pferde, plural, which in case it's a very elegant one for instance or there's a poetic context, it could also be formally and Hoshli described as das Ross, singular, die Rösser, plural, the steed. However, the noun Röslein is a poetic minimized form of die Rose, singular, die Rosen, plural, the rose. Makes sense, because it goes hand in hand even better with the verb Blüte, a conjugated form of Blühen to bloom or to blossom. But then again, back then, I thought Blüte could refer to the also existing German saying Blühen und Gedeihen, blooming and prospering. Which basically refers to something, not necessarily a flower, that really is in best condition, best shape, it simply works perfectly well and does well in general. What makes these and many other lines in many other songs, not only by Rammstein, but also by many other German artists and other poems, really poetic is not only the choice of literally outstanding German terms, but also the use of an ellipsis in each line's last words. Stehen usually is stehen, to stand. They sound the same but they aren't spelled the same. By dropping the vowel e in the suffix en at the end of many terms in German, well, these terms are verbalized a bit shorter. It isn't so obvious with this one because the sound is the same, but it's more obvious in the other related term in the context of these lyrics, which is Höhen, the plural form of die Höhe, the height. Die Höhen. All lines in the verses strongly remind of old classic German fairy tales by Brothers Grimm and other authors or poets, which really gives these lines a classy and elegant quality. What is linguistically and more specifically phonetically interesting about the endings of these two lines and the last syllables is that even though they aren't really the same endings, they still have a rhyming quality to them. Because on the one hand you have stehen and then you have höhen. On the one side we have the vowel e and then we have the umlaut ö. They're not the same, of course, but there's a rhyming quality, in a way. Uh -huh. 